Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, ready for the event. Mobius Science Center and Gonzaga Preparatory School. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Mobius Science Center and Gonzaga Preparatory School. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear, and I'm very excited to hear from you. Welcome to Space Station. How does microgravity affect plant growth? Does it change the structure like it does with humans? 
That's a great question right off the bat because that is something that we are studying right now on Space Station. Right around the corner from me, we have a veggie plant growth facility that is uh, replicating some of the future technologies that we're going to use to grow plants on Space Station. So plants have the same basic needs up here that they do on Earth, like light, water, and nutrients. And plants also grow toward the light source, just like they do on Earth. And we have found that the roots are not, the root growth direction are not impacted by microgravity or lighting. What's interesting is that seeds grown on the space station are very different. So the structure of chromosomes are altered and they have altered gene expressions. Uh, one example is the cell walls and the walls of the vascular system that transport water and nutrients uh, from the roots to the rest of the plants are a little thinner. And cell structures like uh, mitoc mitochondria are round when grown in space uh, and they have a lower electron density. And so uh, that's a great question because that's something that we are studying right now. Uh, and we are learning how to grow plants uh, both for the health of the astronauts in, in air, uh, you know, plants are good for the air, and also so to supplement our diet with leafy greens when we're doing longer duration missions like to the moon and Mars. What is the biggest struggle or hardest task to do well in space? You know, everything's a little bit different in space. I'll say one of the harder things is just getting used to working up here. You know, when you first get here on your first couple of days, you're running into walls, you're holding on to things, you're trying to figure out how to crawl around and microgravity, you're trying to figure out which way is up. And eventually you kind of get used to the fact that it doesn't really matter which way is up. Uh, your brain kind of remaps in 3D so that, uh, you know, walls can be the floor, the ceiling can be a wall. Uh, and so adjusting to it is a little bit harder. And then I would also say any tasks that, that involve a lot of small little parts. You know, we fix a lot of things on Space Station. This is our, our very large house. It's the size of a football field, and sometimes things break. And sometimes things break in ways that we weren't expecting. And so we have to do maintenance. And maybe we have, you know, 10 small screws that are going to come out, and, and they, they would just float away. And so figuring out how to manage all of your tools and all of the screws and washers and everything that you're using to fix something, uh, that can be challenging and sometimes frustrating. Do ages do you age the same way in space as on Earth? So you know we experience time the same way up here in uh, space that uh, that you do on Earth, and so we don't age any differently. Now that said, some of the stress and the radiation and the microgravity environment can cause effects on our body that are similar to aging. Things like loss of bone density or immune dysfunction or stiffening of the arteries or muscular, uh, muscular atrophy and even increased cancer risk. So those are similar to aging, uh, but it's not accelerated aging. Uh, they did a twin study. Maybe you've heard about Scott Kelly and Mark, Mark Kelly. They're both astronauts, and Scott Kelly came up to space for a year, and they did a lot of tests to compare he and his brother when they got back, uh, when Scott got back, uh, to see if they saw anything different. And it's a little bit too preliminary to make any definitive conclusions, but there are some interesting things that they're looking into, like altered DNA. Do you see garbage floating in space? Well, so I see garbage floating in space when, uh, when the garbage get, comes out of our garbage can, like this piece of paper, and goes floating around. Now, I don't see too much when we look out of our window, but debris up in, up in orbit where we are, there is a lot of debris outside, and we're traveling very fast. We're traveling 17,500 miles an hour, and that debris is also traveling very quickly. Now, debris can be man-made, like parts of satellites or rockets, and it can also be natural meteoroids. There, in fact, there are over 500,000 pieces of debris that we, are, that we are tracking. We can track it with ground-based radar, optical telescopes, and computer models. 20,000 of those pieces are actually larger than a softball. But when we look out the window, we don't see them. What inspired you to become an astronaut? What education and other kinds of preparation does it take to become an astronaut? You know, I was inspired by exploration and outer space since I was a little girl. Uh, I was three years old when I first told my parents that I wanted to become an astronaut, and that dream never changed. It was something inside of me that I was always passionate about, and I never really could put words to why. I don't know what it was about it, but I can tell you that all along the way, uh, I was continually inspired by exploration. 
Uh, now, there are many paths to becoming an astronaut. The path that interested me was engineering and being a pilot. So I studied aerospace engineering in, uh, in college and in graduate school, and then I flew helicopters for the Army and became a test pilot. Uh, and so that was what I was really passionate about. Uh, so if any of you want to be astronauts, something that I will tell you is follow your passion, because all of my fellow astronauts, we took very different paths to get where we are, but the one thing in common is that we followed our passion because it's a lot of work to become an astronaut, and it's going to take a lot of all-nighters. It's going to take a lot of hard decisions and sacrifices. And in order to stay motivated, you're going to have to be doing something that you're passionate about. Are you exercising space? So exercise in space is really important. It's important not only so uh, for our mood, just as uh, morale of the crew, but also because our body is, is constantly subject to microgravity, which is similar to what happens to your body if you are on bed rest at all times. So we are not walking around, we're not using our calf muscles and our quads every single day as you're walking. So uh, it is very important that we exercise. In fact, we exercise, uh, hello, Nick. We exercise every single day uh, for between an hour and two hours, and we have three different exercise machines here on station. We have a stationary bicycle. Uh, we have a treadmill that we attach to with uh, rubber bands, basically, like large, uh, uh, large rubber bands that, uh, that hold us down, and we wear a harness. And then we also have what we call the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, or ARED, uh, and it is kind of uh, like a multi... Um, weightlifting machine so we can do anything from squats to bench press uh, shoulder presses and uh, you know anything you can do in the gym we can do uh, on the weights and that's really important both for muscle loss and for bone density loss uh, we actually call them countermeasures because we are constantly trying to counter the effects of microgravity on our bodies does the space station ever hit objects when it is in space You know, with over 500,000 pieces of tracked uh, debris up here on space and, and, you know, in the in a similar orbit to where we are, and with many, many more that we don't track, uh, we are hit by debris actually quite frequently. Uh, usually the size is less than about a centimeter. And that collision is actually about the speed of sound. And so the, the hole or the dent that it causes on our space station is the size of that debris because it's hit so fast. Uh, now, that said, any larger pieces of debris, the, the tracked ones that I talked to you about, uh, we actually maneuver out of the way of that debris. So we can, we have folks on the ground that are constantly tracking us. Uh, the Air Force helps us with that, and folks in Mission Control help us with that. And they will actually boost the space station uh, in order to avoid uh, hitting debris. How do you prepare your body for microgravity? You know, coming to space, uh, there's there's no perfect way to replicate what we're going to do up here, but it's really, really important to be fit as possible before we come up to space. You want a strong heart, strong lungs, strong bones, strong muscles, and so we do a lot of working out in the gym, and that's both cardiovascular and strength. We want to be at the at the the height of our fitness when we come up here because this uh, environment can be very hard on your body. Not only are we in microgravity and not using our bones and muscles, but we're also getting hit by radiation. And so we want our immune systems to be as, as strong as possible so that we can, uh, so that we can, that, that we can survive and thrive in an environment as harsh as this on our bodies. How do spacecrafts get fuel when they're in space for a long period of time? Yeah, that's a great question because we are, I, my mission is 204 days. And so uh, we flew this, our Soyuz vehicle from Kazakhstan up here uh, last December, and we're going to fly home in June. So for that vehicle, when we launch and land in the same vehicle, they planned the fuel to incorporate our entire mission. So we brought enough fuel with us. Now, the space station itself, uh, we have kind of an interesting system. I told you about how we, we can move out of the way of orbital debris. What we actually do is when we have cargo resupply vehicles coming up to the space station, we use, they bring extra fuel with them, and when we need to boost the space station, our first choice is to use fuel that those cargo vehicles brought with them. So, for instance, we use the Russian Progress vehicles that are docked to the bottom of the space station. We use their thrusters and their fuel. And in mission planning, the planners on Earth plan for enough fuel in order to be able to do that. What do you hope to see and learn about space in your future as an astronaut? 
You know, that's a great question because the, the International Space Station is a national orbiting laboratory. laboratory. Every single day, we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. So we have, you know, the known knowns. We know what we know. We know what we don't know. And then there's a whole bunch of things that we don't know what we don't know. And that's the exciting thing to me. One of the exciting things about exploration is that every time we learn something new, sometimes it, it opens up another can of worms. It opens up five, five more questions that we want to answer. So NASA, in the near term, we're going to put boots back on the moon uh, by 2024, and we're you're going to use that as a proving ground for long-term uh, Mars missions. And so maybe some of you sitting in the audience are going to be working alongside of us when we go to Mars. Did you feel any differences as the layers of the atmosphere changed as you traveled to the space station? Yeah, that's a fun question because I love talking about the launch because it was one of the most exciting days in my life for sure. Uh, the space station is about 250 miles off of Earth. And so that's not very far, actually. That's the distance if you guys got in your car and drove to Seattle this afternoon. That's how far away from the surface of the Earth we are. Now, when we got in uh, our Soyuz vehicle in Kazakhstan uh, on, you know, on the surface of the Earth, it only took us about nine minutes to get all the way to space. So the biggest thing that we felt was acceleration. Now, some of you have been in, a, in an airplane when it's taking off or even in a car when uh, somebody pushes the gas pretty quickly and you kind of get that, you know, get pinned back in the back of your seat or maybe like a roller coaster. And that's what it felt like. This vehicle was accelerating like an airplane takes off, but that acceleration went over a whole period of nine minutes in three different stages of, uh, of the rocket. And so we didn't really feel the layers of the atmosphere because the overwhelming sensation in our bodies was actually getting pinned to our seats as our rocket was accelerating. And the third stage, and rockets use staging, so part of the rocket burns, uh, burns all the fuel and then drops off, then a second engine lights up, drops off. And we were in our third stage. That's when we were already in orbit, and we were accelerating to 17,500 miles an hour to go catch the space station. And that was like a really shaky roller coaster. To access Internet on the space station, how do you sleep in space? So two good questions. Uh, taking personal time uh, for, our, for the astronauts' mental health is so important when we're up here for six months at a time. And so we are very lucky to have Internet access up here. And so uh, we use it for a couple things. During the day, a lot of our operations projects, our procedures, our, the pictures, our instructions on what we're going to do that day are sent via an Internet that we can access from Mission Control so we can communicate with Mission Control that way. Uh, we also can use the Internet for personal use on our off time, and that's a great way to keep up with family, you know, check our email, uh, things like that. And so we do have access to the Internet. Now, how we sleep in space, uh, we sleep in space just like we do on Earth, except for we would just float away if we didn't tack ourselves down. So we, we sleep in sleeping bags, and they are just uh, hooked to a wall so we don't float away. And each of us have our own crew quarters, which is uh, kind of our own personal space that's about the size of a phone booth. And so we go in there at night and turn off all the lights and uh, crawl in our sleeping bags and, uh, and, and fall asleep. And I can tell you one of the coolest things about getting to space was waking up the first morning and realizing I was floating. That was a little disorienting at first. What does microgravity feel like? You know, microgravity, uh, the first time that I was weightless, something that I realized was it, was it was the first time I felt nothing on my whole body. If I float here, I feel nothing. I don't have any pressure on the bottom of my feet. I'm not standing up. Like all of you in the room, if you're standing up, you have pressure on the bottom of your feet. If you're sitting down, you have pressure on the back of your legs. If you're leaning up against the wall, then you have pressure on your back where you're pushing up against the wall. And all I can say is when you're floating, I feel nothing from head to toe. And that was some, one of the, the most poignant memories I have the first time I floated was it was the first time in my life that I had no sensation, external sensation on my body from head to foot.
What is the most spectacular thing you've seen in space? And have you seen any anomalies from the space station that we cannot see from our perspective on Earth? Yeah, two great questions. Um, one of my favorite things to watch out the window is actually moonsets and moonrises. Uh, you know, the, the moon from here, it's like it jumps off the earth. You can almost see it moving uh, up in the sky. And it's, it's like watching a moonrise or a moonset on fast forward. And it's just so beautiful to watch the, the curvature of the earth and the moon just skipping off and coming up into the sky. It's, that's definitely one of my favorite things. Now, as far as what looks different from here is just the perspective that we have. You know, we saw a very large tropical storm a couple months ago. And the perspective that I really got was, wow, this is a very, very large uh, weather pattern that is affecting a very large portion of the Earth. Now, when we hear about these weather patterns on Earth, it's always attributed to being in a country or in one location. And from here, the perspective that you get is you look down at the Earth and you just see the very large hurricane and you realize these affect everybody in the same way. We don't see borders from space. And so one of the perspectives that it's given me is that, hey, Earth is small and we're all in this together and we are all affected uh, by the weather patterns and we are, we are all stewards of, of the environment and we really need to take care of our Earth. Hi, my name is Addie DeCaro, and I'd like to thank you so much for your time. We enjoyed talking to you, and we wish you happy last weeks on the space station. Thank you. Thank you to everybody in Spokane. It was great to hear from you guys, and I can't wait to be back in the Pacific Northwest here in a few short months. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants from Mobius Science Center and Gonzaga Preparatory School. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Thank you.